Today we're going to be looking into the scripture and doing a study on the subject of why am I lonely? And this is sadly one of the most common social ailments in our world today as you're going to discover uh, Webster in his dictionary defines lonely as, quote, being without company, cut off from others, not frequented by human beings, sad from being alone, producing a feeling of bleakness or desolation, end quote. That was Webster's definition of lonely, but as we go into the scripture today, you're going to find that that definition falls far short of what the real uh, root of loneliness is because it is possible to be surrounded by hundreds of people. Uh, you can be in a stadium full of people. You can be with friends and family in a very uh, exciting, entertaining party atmosphere and still be lonely. So loneliness is not just isolation. And I think it's important for you to understand this because I'm sure that many that will listen to this, you perhaps went on to the podcast channel or onto the YouTube channel or onto the Facebook channel because of the title, you identify with it because many of you are battling with it. And I want to help you today. So we're going to go into the scripture and I want to read beginning in John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, because the most important question today is not what is loneliness. And that's really where Webster's definition and I part company. I'm not in any way uh, attacking Mr. Webster and his dictionary, but his definition was basically what is loneliness? But what most people struggle with is why. Not the fact that you are lonely, but why am I lonely? And today in our time together through the scripture, we're going to answer that question. John chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 1, and I'm going to read the entirety of the story, as I most often do, and read down through verse 26, and I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way, and eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God that he has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty 
again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. What a rich story. And uh, there's so much here that I would like to uh, teach and go over with you. I am always fascinated by the progression of this woman coming into relationship with Christ. She starts off by calling him Jew. And, uh, and as a Samaritan, this probably was not in uh, a gracious way. And then as Jesus begins to speak to her, and she realizes that she's dealing with more than a mere man. She refers to him as sir. And then as he, through a word of knowledge, begins to talk to her without having any knowledge of her history, but by the revelation of the gift of the word of knowledge, Jesus spoke to her about her many failed relationships. And then she calls him prophet. And then eventually Christ and Messiah enters into the vocabulary as there is always a progression from the loneliness of a broken life into right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And today you're going to learn perhaps some of the most biblical lessons that you have ever learned on the subject of loneliness. And I want you to be incredibly mindful as we study together because I think many of you that will listen to this, this time together is not just exclusively for you. Many of you have friends and loved ones and people that you work with that are going through loneliness. You've had discussions. You've heard them talk about how lonely and desperate they feel. And I'm going to challenge many of you as you listen to this to make a list of people that you need to share this with because I think it'll be of great help to them and I think they'll respect you for sharing it and it perhaps will even make your relationship even more substantial than it already is. Just before we begin, we always pray together, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we never open up the Holy Bible without an awareness of our need of you and the help and the guidance and the tutelage of the Holy Spirit, I pray that as we walk through the scriptures today and deal with this difficult subject, that you will, by the Holy Spirit, help people and minister to people 
and help them to understand why they wrestle with loneliness and the despair oftentimes that comes from the depth of loneliness. My prayer above all is that not one person who's listening will walk away from this time together without a knowledge that God loves them, that God forgives all confessed sin, and that if they're not in right relationship with God today, I pray that when we join together in final prayer at the end of this time together and give people an opportunity to turn from sin and turn to Christ, that you'll give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do. And we'll be careful to give you praise for all things, for we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Many notables in the field of psychiatry agree that loneliness is the most devastating malady that exists in our modern world. I came across a study by the American Council on Life Insurance and found that by their studies, the loneliest group of people in the world are college students. A student in one university carved this pathetic question on his desk, and it said, quote, Why am I so lonely when there are over 2,000 people here? End quote. Did you know that over 600,000 teenagers try to commit suicide every year, and most of them in response that have survived have said that they were battling overwhelming loneliness. Others rate high on the list of most lonely are divorced people, single mothers, housewives, and the elderly. I want to share with you in our study from the scripture that there are levels of loneliness and there are reasons why people battle loneliness. And that is really what I want you to grasp today is I want you to be able to identify where loneliness is coming from in your life. And so I always ask you to take notes because I believe the Bible and the truth of God and what we learn together in this time uh, will enrich your life and edify your life if you'll take the time to not only listen, but for the sake of retention, I always encourage people, keep life notes. Have some type of journal or way of keeping life notes of all of the things that God reveals to you through the Word, and it will result in a much stronger, more stable, not only life, but purpose in life and relationship with God. So if you're taking notes, number one, I want to talk to you about the loneliness of solitude. Uh, did you know that isolation and loneliness was the very first thing that God identified in the Bible and said that it wasn't good. God said loneliness isn't good. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God said, It is not good for man to be alone. You were not created to be alone. You were not created to be isolated. You were not created to feel as if no one cares or no one understands. You were created for fellowship and happiness and joy and fulfillment. But many of you have never been able to successfully figure out why you've been so inconsistent in some of those areas of your life. Listen today and I believe that you'll understand better exactly where you're at. The famous H.G. Wells said on his 65th birthday, quote, I am 65 and I am lonely and I have never found peace. Albert Einstein said, quote, It is strange to be known so universally and yet I feel so very lonely, end quote. Uh, the last thing that Elvis Presley ever wrote down, uh, it was actually seen 
by one of his aides and uh, a piece of paper that he crumbled and discarded threw in the trash. And after his unfortunate death, uh, this aide went into the bedroom and found that note that she had seen him write hours before he had passed away. And the note read like this. Elvis Presley said the last thing he ever penned, quote, I feel so alone sometimes. The night is quiet for me. I'd love to be able to sleep. I'm glad that everyone is gone now, but I'll probably not rest. I have no need for all of this. Please help me, Lord. The Bible speaks of the loneliness of solitude. Uh, the psalmist wrote, if you want to turn to it, it's in Psalm 102. Psalm 102, verses 6 and 7, the scripture said, I am like an owl in the desert, like a lonely owl in the far off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely, as a solitary bird on the roof. It's amazing how closely the comments are between the psalmist in Psalm 102 and the last note written by Elvis Presley. But solitude often amplifies the feelings of loneliness. But as you're going to learn today, solitude is not always the reason why people are lonely. Solitude and isolation, though they are breeding grounds for wrestling with loneliness, they are not always the cause. Which brings us to number two, the loneliness of society. Many times we're surrounded by crowds and interaction and work at the office or young people at school or college or at church with friends and social activities and so on. But being surrounded with a crowd does not always solve the problem of loneliness. For there is not only the loneliness of solitude, there is also the loneliness of society. You were created according to the scripture with a twofold need. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that all of us were created in the image of God. Every person listening to me. You are not a descendant of a monkey. Your forefathers were not animals. You were created in the image of God. And God created every human being with a twofold need. Be sure to write them down. Number one, you were created to have fellowship with God. And number two, you were created to have companionship with other people. And if either of those two are missing, then your life becomes vulnerable and fertile soil for the seeds of loneliness, separation, isolation, and oftentimes that leads to despair. And remember, there's no substitute. There's no way that you can come up with something in your life through success or achievement or, or wealth or fame. There's nothing that can be a substitute in your life for that twofold purpose. Fellowship with God and companionship with other people. I might add that fellowship with God and companionship with other people healthy companionship, I may add, is found in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's one of the greatest reasons why we were told by God in Scripture that one day out of every seven, we were to be found in the house of God. Why? Because in the course of life and in the course of work and in the course of responsibilities, we must never separate ourselves from that twofold purpose. And once a week, you should be found in a Bible believing church with a godly pastor. And in the church, you will find fellowship with God 
and companionship with other people. In John chapter 5, Jesus visits a paralytic who had had this condition, the scripture says, for over 38 years. And Jesus asked him why he had not got into the pool, because that pool uh, in that day, they believed that on occasion that angels came and stirred the waters of the pool and the first ones to get into the pool received miracles or signs or wonders. And uh, whether or not that was factual, uh, we do not know. But Jesus, recognizing that this was a part of the superstition of that particular area, walks up to this paralytic man who had been in this condition for 38 years and asked him, how come you don't get into the pool? His response was, I don't have anyone to help me. You see, he not only was suffering with physical malady, he was suffering with the malady of isolation and loneliness, surrounded at that pool by hopeful people, people who believed in miracles, people who were desperate. But though he was surrounded by his society and those who had similar physical needs, his problem was deeper. He said, I have no one, no one in his life, no one who cared, no one to help him. He was suffering physically and he was suffering internally with loneliness. I read in my research of a Hall of Fame football player that uh, is a hero, but I just feel not to share his name. But he told an interviewer this, quote, I sit in my beautiful house and sometimes I realize I am just so lonely it's unbelievable. And life has been so good to me. I have a good wife, good kids, money, my health but I am incredibly lonely and bored. I also came across a piece that dealt with a young, beautiful Hollywood starlet who not long ago took her life and it shocked all of her family and friends because it just seemed externally she was happy and fulfilled and famous and wealthy, but she left a brief, stunning note behind that stated, quote, I cannot take this anymore. I am unbearably lonely. And so we've learned today that there is the loneliness of solitude, but there is also the loneliness of society. Number three, there is also the loneliness of sorrow. Many times people go through things in life that break their heart or bring sorrow into their heart or into their life or into their mind and they don't know how to deal with it and nothing suffices and it leaves them with the desperation of loneliness. After the death of her husband, the historically famous Queen Victoria said, quote, there is no one left to call me Victoria. Because she was a queen, everyone had to address her by the standards of royalty. And the only person that was allowed to address her by her actual name was her husband. And when her husband passed away, she obviously was dealing with the loneliness of sorrow. And that famous statement, there is no one left in the world who can call me Victoria even though she was perhaps the most famous queen in all of the earth. She was battling sorrow and with that loneliness. Uh, many react to the loneliness of sorrows and hurt by dealing with the symptoms rather than dealing with the cause. And as a result, it's not uncommon to find people dealing with the loneliness of sorrow becoming more involved in seeking pleasures and parties and social activities and they go in and out of relationships and sadly into immorality, all of which fades away, none of which truly satisfies, 
the cause and the root of loneliness, it remains with an ever-growing, gnawing feeling of emptiness. Some deal with loneliness and hurts by building walls around their lives. And instead of indulging in pleasures and activities and relationships, they do just the opposite. They put themselves aside, build walls around themselves. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to be around people. Their lives and emotions and feelings are turned into a personal fortress, fearing to allow anyone to penetrate the barrier that they have built. In uh, John chapter 11 in the scriptures, we read about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, their beloved brother, had died and Jesus had not come. And they obviously felt uh, perhaps upset, maybe even upset with Jesus because they had said, if you had come, we know that he would still be alive. And they wept and felt the grief and the loss of a loved one. And perhaps many of you have gone through that, where you've lost somebody that was very important to you, whether it was a husband or a wife, or, or maybe not even through death. Maybe you felt like you had a healthy marriage. And then all of a sudden, one day you woke up and realized it was over, or you were abandoned, or you were left. You were involved in a relationship and had placed so much hope and weight in that relationship and what it might bring to the fulfillment of your life, only to find that after that relationship shattered and broke and fell apart, that you were left instead of the hope of the future. You were left with incredible grief and loneliness and despair and you're wondering, how do I recover from this? I, I want to get out of this dark hole, but it just seems like I can't. The Bible tells us that Christ can do that. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. And someone needs to hear this today. Maybe you've gone through that. And as you're listening to this very study, you're battling with loneliness, whether it's one of the first or the second or the third phase of loneliness that we're teaching today, you're dealing with it. You feel the emptiness. You feel there's no satisfaction. There's no fulfillment. Will I ever be able to get out of this darkness that I feel and the loneliness that captivates me? You need to know that Christ cares about you and that you can cast your cares upon him. You don't have to hide. You can come to Jesus Christ and show him the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he'll not love you less. He'll take you into his fold, and he'll begin to minister to your life. The fact that you may be surrounded by society, friends, and family does not always solve the problem of loneliness. And lastly, Number four, there is the loneliness of sin. Loneliness is often the reason why people go further into sin. Loneliness is oftentimes the reason why people become emotionally or sexually involved in one relationship after another. They seem to think that that relationship will fill the emptiness and the void that they feel inside. It is oftentimes the reason why people who are married enter into extramarital affairs. Is they're in a marriage, they have quote unquote companionship, uh, their spouse is in the house, but yet they feel this deep loneliness and they wonder why and they become vulnerable. And sadly for many, it is this loneliness of sin that can cause them to begin to wander out of the God-given relationship of holy marriage into an illicit relationship and into affairs outside of marriage. Blaise Pascal, the noted French scientist, said that in every human heart, 
there exists a God vacuum. And what Pascal meant by that is that because we were created in the image of God, that there is a place inside the human heart that only right relationship with God can fill. Ultimately, loneliness is the result of our sin nature separating us from God. That is so important for you to grasp. I want you to write it down. Let me say it again. As we come to the end of our study, ultimately, loneliness is the result of our sin nature that separates us from God. Consequently, any effort to deal with loneliness that does not address this basic truth will only provide brief and temporary relief. Centuries ago, a man by the name of Augustine put his finger on the root cause of loneliness when he said this, and I love this, quote, God created man for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in him. Isn't that rich? Let me read it to you again. God created man for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in him. In John chapter 13, we read the story of the Last Supper and uh, the infancy of the betrayal of Judas. And the Bible said that Judas went out and it was night. And though it may be talking, and I'm sure probably was the author's original intent, talking about what time of day it was when it said Judas went out and it was night. For Judas, there was also a spiritual night in his betrayal of Christ, in his walking away from Christ, in his violation of his relationship with Christ. Life became a permanent night. And I'm sure that there are some who will listen to this Bible study together who once knew the presence of Christ. And I'm not saying you're Judas, but your situation is similar. You once had fellowship with the Lord. You once saw the power of God. You experienced the power of God, the presence of God for yourself. You once had the joy of salvation. But perhaps through loneliness or an emptiness or something gnawing deep inside of you that wasn't satisfied, you wandered away from the Lord. One of the individuals who listens, and I understand there are a few hundred thousand people who listen to these studies at least once a month, but they private messaged me this week, and I sensed just, I believe, by the Spirit of the Lord, I responded back. They had relocated with their job, and I said, have you found a good Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. And their response was, I haven't been to church in over four years now, if I'm honest. And as I corresponded with them, and I began by saying, there's no judgment in this, and then I began to speak to them through that private message, they responded, I've never felt judgment from you, and what you said is true. Let me just say this because I've learned in recent days through social media that there are people all over the world who do not have the opportunity of going to a good Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. There are people from all over the world listening to these broadcasts and Bible studies, many of which live in countries where Christianity is against the law. To own a Bible or to read a Bible or to meet in a Christian church church of fellowship would be the result death penalty. I understand, and this isn't all. I pray that every one of you can find a good Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. But for those of you who perhaps that is not possible, I challenge you, will you allow me to be a spiritual voice in your life 
You cannot neglect fellowship with God. You cannot neglect fellowship with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot neglect living in the covenant of God and wonder why things in your life are not fitting together as they should. And if you are in a place of desperation and you have no place to turn, then I humbly ask you to allow me to be a trusted voice. We care about you. Judy and I pray for the people who listen to these studies. Our staff pray for you. We care about you. This ministry exists so that you don't have to wallow in the hole of dark hopelessness. And loneliness was not God's plan for your life. The joy of salvation can be yours. And you can escape from the prison that you may have surrounded yourself with. Some have built walls around themselves because of loneliness and despair and isolation. Others of you perhaps are trying everything under the sun, trying to satisfy that emptiness and longing in your heart. Let me close by praying with you and making this final point. You were created to have fellowship with God and you were created to have communion with other people. And unless those two are properly active in your life, then you're going to be vulnerable to the attack of loneliness. Make no mistake, the enemy of your soul is behind everything negative. The Bible says the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Christ came that you might have life. And the first step to breaking the chains of loneliness solitude, despair, hurt, is to make peace with God. Cast all of your cares upon Him today. Will you pray with me? There's power in prayer that can change your life and change whatever situation you may be in. You may feel like it's utterly hopeless and that God no longer cares, but that's not true. He wouldn't have led you today to the message of the Scriptures if he didn't want to bring you back to spiritual health. You were created to have life and purpose and joy and fulfillment and to provide that for others as well. That's only available by breaking the curse of sin and receiving the joy and the favor of salvation. You can do that by praying with me right now. And when we're done praying, I always challenge people please go to our website, lostlamb.org. It's on the screen. And write me a brief email and let me know that you prayed that prayer today. We want to do everything that we can as a ministry to follow through and to help you and to keep you rooted and grounded in your faith. And God not only can bring you back to spiritual health, He can use you to bring others back to right relationship with Him as well. Will you pray with me today? By the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you already feel that tug in your heart. and You know you need to pray. Let's do it right now. Just say this, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to have a right relationship with God. You gave your only son, Jesus, who suffered on the cross so that I do not have to suffer in my life. I recognize my sin and I repent of my sin in childlike faith. I turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I receive the gift of salvation. And I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior this very day. And I vow I will live for you. I cast all my cares upon you, even in prayer, because you care for me. I thank you that in my life you work signs and wonders and miracles as I live in the covenant of God. And I receive your forgiveness and salvation 
and newness of life because all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today I'm saved and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.